Coming up on Point of View, originally from Chicago, Max Gonzalez is an artist, muralist, and activist who was once given the title of Pittsburgh's most wanted graffiti vandal. How did he get into art? Where does his artist name, Gems, come from? And what has his experience been like in Pittsburgh's art community? This is POV. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Michelangelo Pellis, and joining us in the studio today is Max Gonzalez. Max, also known by his artist name Gems, moved to the Pittsburgh area in 2012. He presented as a guest artist, lectured, and runs workshops at the University of Pittsburgh, Carnegie Mellon University, Youth Places Northside, and the Environmental Charter School. Thank you so much for joining us, Max. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we're gonna get into some questions here. Does that sound all right? Yeah. All right. So. You were once named public enemy number one by Pittsburgh Police Department's Graffiti Task Force. What was it like having the Pittsburgh Police Department on your back? Yeah, so Pittsburgh is a very unique city in the way that we do have a full-time graffiti task force. Um, about every five to six years or so, they pick a new most wanted. So prior to myself, there was Ian Hurt. Prior to that, there was Danny Montano, MF1, uh, Mook, and the first was Surge. Um, so yeah, it's just like a succession of things. It's a very arbitrary title, but uh, it, it it felt a little silly. What are your thoughts on illegal graffiti now? Um, do you view it as an art, as an act of vandalism or rebellion, or can it be both? Yeah, I, I really don't see vandalism as being a disqualifier for art. Um, a lot of time in art, fine art, you're told to make art that is... Uh, as intrusive or um, as powerful as possible or breaking the rules and somehow. So the most art breaking or rule breaking art form is something that does challenge uh, existing laws and that is vandalism. Um, so yeah, I, I really do see any illegal graffiti as absolutely being vandalism, but I don't see that as making it not art. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, so tell us a little bit how you got into art to begin with. Yeah, um, I've been drawing my whole life. Um, I grew up in southwest side of Chicago, uh, spent a lot of time in Pilsen. Um, that's where my mom taught high school, my grandpa taught, uh, did the football program. That's kind of known as like Chicago's graffiti and mural mecca. Um, so I just grew up seeing this stuff everywhere and slowly I would start to replicate this stuff in my sketchbook without even knowing what it was or who was making it. I just knew that I, it, I liked it and it looked cool. And, um, yeah, so slowly and slowly I, uh, kept drawing, went to high school and I luckily had a high school art teacher who decided to push me as hard as I could be pushed. And, um, at that point, uh, I think about sophomore, junior year, I decided that I wanted to pursue art for for college and uh, as a career yeah okay that sounds it's always an inspiring high school teacher who yeah. pushes you along the way okay so then how did how did that turn into illegal graffiti and how did you learn the ropes of you know going out and tagging and yeah um so graffiti and spray can art was always something completely separate of my like fine art and my visual art uh, so when I applied for colleges, they didn't know that I did graffiti. Mm -hmm. um, I was applying with like my printmaking, painting, et cetera. Um, but that ended up getting me a full ride to go to Carnegie Mellon uh, in 2012 for visual art. Uh, prior to moving to Pittsburgh, though, I was doing graffiti. I probably had started to think of it a little more seriously when uh, I was about like age 15, 16 or so. Um and I, I absolutely was what you would call a toy. I was just really seeking to vandalize as many things as I could, climb as many things as I could. Uh, but when I came to Pittsburgh, that's when I first kind of got confronted by the idea that I wasn't good at graffiti. Mm. Um, just because inherently being a good drawer um, and a good artist, I, I thought, well, I must be good at graffiti um, mm. if I'm good at those things where... Graffiti skills are something completely different, uh, but luckily I did have a few mentors early on in Pittsburgh who said, hey, your work sucks. Um, <laughs> here's how you can do better. Okay, cool. And um, 
I mean, what was it specifically that attracted you to Pittsburgh and to Carnegie Mellon? Carnegie Mellon was it um, just just for school, or did you have Pittsburgh in mind as a place you wanted to be? Uh, no, not at all. Um, I really just applied to every top art school. Um, I think in total, I probably applied to like over 10 schools. I was like, all right, whoever gives me the most money, that's where I'm going. Um, I really wanted to go to SEIC in Chicago. Um, I guess I was outbidded or whatever with CMU where they said free. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. Um, I never even visited Pittsburgh until uh, the day before I moved into college, uh, I had no clue where Pittsburgh was. I thought it was like a farm town or something. <laughs> um, so driving in, I was like, oh, all right. It's kind of a city. Yeah. Um, yeah and uh, since 2012, I've been here ever since. Yeah. And um, it's by now clear that you have an affinity for making the city more beautiful or bringing art to the city. What makes it the perfect canvas? Um, part of it for sure is that Pittsburgh's mural gra scene, graffiti scene, spray can art scene is pretty behind most cities, such mm -hmm. as Chicago. Uh, just because Pittsburgh has always had that graffiti task force um, and has always pushed a lot of people out of graffiti mm -hmm. and spray can art, uh, its mural scene just really hasn't had time to develop. Um, equally in Chicago, the majority uh, of graffiti writers that I knew, if not the majority that do it in Chicago, are Latino um, or Mexican American, mm -hmm. such as myself, and uh, that population just doesn't exist in Pittsburgh. Uh, so I definitely took that model of what I saw in Chicago, where every street corner store was painted with graffiti, where you would go up to the owner and say, "Hey, I noticed your building's covered in tags. Do you mind if me and my buddies go and uh, paint something better on top of that?" Um, or where Graffiti was just less thought of as a nuisance, where it was more understood as just being an inherent part of the culture. Uh, so with Pittsburgh just having tons and tons of blank walls and uh, not a lot of people who were capable yeah. of doing mural-type works with spray can art, uh, it was kind of just a very lucky coincidence that I was here. Uh, and, and the scene is just starting to boom right now. Yeah, so um, what are the telltale signs that the scene is taking off now? Um, really that there are multiple people in the city right now who have a full-time mural career, mm -hmm. um, who can be full-time artists. Uh, so my business partner, Shane Pilster, um, Ashley Hoder, uh, Brian Ganella, Jerome Charles, uh, that's just to name a few. If I'm forgetting people, I'm sorry. Huh. Um, but yeah, so it's to know that there is this larger community of us, uh, who, can sustainably look to that as a career. Mm -hmm. Do you see the Mexican American community growing in the graffiti scene? No. Um, currently, there are, uh, I think, three Latino graffiti writers in Pittsburgh, um, including myself. So it, it really isn't, or even in the mural scene. Yeah. Um, people in Pittsburgh have remarked to me that, like, yeah, the uh, the Mexican population, Latino population is growing, uh, but so is everyone else's Latino population in the world. Mm -hmm. So um, it really is not that noticeable, but I would be very happy to see that grow even more. Yeah, of course. Um, okay, so you graduated from CMU with honors in 2016 while playing hockey. Um, what did you study and how did you manage school athletics and being a wanted vandal at the time? Yeah. Um, so I've been I've been playing ice hockey like my whole life. Um, I grew up south side, southwest side Chicago. Uh, there was luckily a lot of like hockey programs um, on the south side and south suburbs of Chicago. So I got to be part of a lot of house leagues growing up, and I carried that on all the way through high school. Um, so at a certain point, I realized all right, hockey's not my career. Um, I'm not going to go to a college for hockey uh, necessarily, unless if I want my career to end right after that. Um, so I, I just saw that CMU had a club hockey program. So I was like, okay, added benefit. Um, so yeah, it was cool to be able to play a college sport while also being a fine art student, uh, which is obviously like a very odd mashup. Right. <laughs> um, very high school musical, but... <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but yeah, then at the same time, I was going out doing graffiti uh, from like 1 a.m. to 4 a.m. in the morning. Um, 
yeah, so it'd be a schedule of art school all day, hockey, usually a late e- evening, get done with that around 11, go back home, uh, get my supplies together, go out, go paint, and then wake up uh, at like 10 a.m. or something. Do it all over again. Do it all over again every day. Sounds like quite a time. Yep. <laughs> um, your your artist name, Gems, I wanted to ask like how this name came to you and what what it means to you. Yeah, um, a lot of people think I came up with it because it's a reversal of um, my initials, like oh. with an S added, mm-hmm. but that's just a coincidence. Um, yeah, a lot of people are like, oh, we cracked the code. I'm like, <laughs> no, nah, it's not. Just a coincidence. Um, more so, it's just, I guess, that those letters repeat a lot of my name, so I guess I'm naturally inclined mm-hmm. to use those. Um, but also the whole idea of like hidden gems, um, mm-hmm. just little gems here and there where I was sprinkling graffiti everywhere yeah. um, or sometimes just blowing up graffiti everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Makes sense. Um, how many murals um, are you working on at a time? Um, during the summertime, uh, it's pretty chaotic. So uh, as far as like overlapping of mocking up murals, planning stages and painting, uh, probably... Within one month of the summer, we might be working on like 10 different murals or so. Wow. Um, so it's pretty chaotic. Yeah. Are they, um, you know, like in terms of like geographically, you know, are they spaced out all over the city? Are there certain areas um, you guys prefer to be working in at any given time? Or how do you map it all out? Um, so it's definitely a mixture of all over the cities as far as in the city, but also surrounding suburbs. Uh, but then we also travel a lot for murals. Um, so the farthest we've gone to paint for commissioned murals is uh, Col- um, yeah, Colorado, Wow, um, Reno. And in those cases, we got flown out to go paint there Wow, uh, and got our, our hotel paid for and all that. Um, so yeah, it's- That's fantastic. It's definitely a, a strange situation to be able to be paid to go fly somewhere to paint mm-hmm. with the spray can yeah. or before I was like scrounging up as much paint as I could and I don't know, uh, finding locations within the city. But still, I, I love to paint in the East End where I've only ever lived in the East End of Pittsburgh. Um, yeah, I, I love it in the East End and I'm still a resident there. So if I can contribute more to that community that brought me up and yeah. uh, gave a lot to me, I'd I'd love to just keep giving back to that. Yeah, that's great. You have the opportunity to do that now. Um, so this is your full time job then. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Um, what are your uh, some of your favorite murals that you've done so far, and uh, why? Um, one of my favorites, uh, which I'm actually hosting a exhibition for right now, um, is the Vault Art mural. Um, Good morning, Penav. How are you? That's the title. Um, but. Uh, Vault Art Studio in Garfield on Penn Avenue. It's a art studio for adults with developmental and intellectual disabilities. Um, so I hired a whole artist team of six local muralists, and then we got 12 vault artists to work with us, and we got them all paid, and we did this massive collaborative mural um, that has tons of cartoon characters and all kinds of wild imagery on it. And it was just one of the few murals I got to do that was just uninhibited fun um and yeah art for art's sake um but yeah now i'm hosting a retrospective for that mural at irma freeman center uh for imagination which is right up the block so i do curate art shows as well um but that's just kind of more so a passion project right cool um so you recently debuted a new piece on smithfield could you tell us a little bit more about how that one came to be yeah um so Myself and Shane Pilster with um, our company, unofficial company, DoWhatWeLove.com, uh, we were hired to do the Strawberry Strawberry Way mural. Uh, we worked with Kappa students for about two months, taught in their classes, and uh, then went on to go paint that mural with 36 of their students. Um, so I guess they just kind of saw like how productive we were and how well we worked and, with the site. And um, yeah, they reached out to us, Pittsburgh Downtown Partnership, and said, hey, we have these uh, boarded up buildings. 
um, that keep getting vandalized. And something we always tell everyone is the best deterrent to tagging in vandalism is better graffiti or a spray can art painted mural. Um, yeah, so we painted both these sides for them super quick, knocked it out for the client, and then they also said, hey, we have these other boarded up walls that keep getting vandalized. Can you paint some pretty trees on it? Uh, and then, unfortunately, the 7-Eleven closed down on Smithfield Street. They had to board that up. Um, but in the meantime, they were like, hey, can you cover this with something more visually appealing? Um, so, yeah, muralism is absolutely just a very affordable quicker way to give a site something uh i don't know much prettier to look at and mm -hmm. it in some cases it definitely can just be a band-aid uh but as far as a something to give back to the community it's one of the quickest things you can do yeah that makes sense um what other murals can people expect to see popping up this year um we are working with uh a lot of nonprofits at the moment a lot of like educational projects um so we we are going to do some more art programming with Sweetwater Center for the Arts, um, more stuff in the East End. There's definitely some projects that like I can't quite make public yet. Um, but yeah, it, it's definitely a lot of stuff in the East End, uh, but more stuff also with um, Central Outreach Wellness Center. Um, we okay. do a lot of work for them. Uh, that's my PCP, and uh, they actually were the first people to give me a professional mural. I get a paid professional mural, and since then we've painted, I think, five different locations for them. Um, so, yeah, we are, like, we're doing some more locations for them in Ohio coming up. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so next I want to talk about your artist statement on your website. You acknowledge both the setbacks and the value in labeling your identity. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what this means to you and what you want your audience to take away from your work? Yeah, um, I mean, uh, I feel like my identity as far as like being a queer uh, Latino person, um, Latinx person in Pittsburgh is highlighted, where in Chicago, there's tons and tons of other Mexican Americans where out here, it's kind of like, oh, I guess I'm a representative of that now. Um, yeah, so I, I think acquiring identities is important um, and being proud of those identities is important, but having static concepts of those things and placing yourself in, uh, I don't know, others' expectations of what those might be can be a little um, harmful to yourself. Um, or equally, that's kind of what happens with graffiti is that you get to develop your own identity. Um, so even if you are given a name, you can say, I want this to be my graffiti name or my street art name or mural name. And you get to entirely create who that is and how they operate. Um, so it's just ownership of identity while also not putting too many expectations on yourself. This week, we are excited to debut a new segment called Paint a View, where we have our guests embrace their inner artist. Max, are you ready? Yeah. Let's do it. All right. We're going to start with a little Bob Ross inspired tutorial since you are a professional artist. And um, we thought what better to sketch than the place where your work is displayed, the Pittsburgh skyline. Yeah. I've uh, painted so many Pittsburgh skylines. All right. Well, perfect. You've had some practice, so you should be able to walk us through this today then. Yeah. So usually anytime I sketch or draw, I like to start with uh, a lightest marker, okay. if possible, or even lightest spray paint to do a sketch. Uh, I like to take advantage of like holding at a sharp angle so you get like a wide stroke out of it. But really a skyline, just hold it like pretty tight and just mm -hmm. do a lot of up and down motions. Uh, Pittsburgh skyline, definitely get like a nice little building at an angle. Right. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, I'm not great at all the names of the buildings. Right, I know uh, there's there's a PPG and like yeah. a BNY, a lot of like three letter abbreviations. So it's just a lot of occasional uh, larger shapes, okay. then smaller, and then stacking squares on top of squares. Uh, obviously you also have to make space for a uh, bridge over there, so right. try to get the end just give it like a little arch and that makes it Pittsburgh. Um, that did make it Pittsburgh right there. Yeah. 
So from the bottom, we can just do one straight line. It doesn't have to be perfect. Okay. Uh, and then also at the bottom, uh, to make it more Pittsburgh, you add some water, uh, which can just be done with a blue color. Uh, and with that water, like even a technique I use a lot with uh, spray paint, is just a back and forth stroke. It doesn't need to be even. Okay. It just creates the effect of a um, kind of like a, a light reflecting. Mm. And then having the majority of that light being in the center, so filling in the sides more than you do in the center. Uh, and you can also even add in some other colors where a lot of people think of water and they think exclusively blue, uh, but there's always a lot of colors in water. So I'll add some green on the sides. Especially in Pittsburgh water, there's a lot, yeah. of, there's a lot of murky colors in there. Don't go swimming. Um, and then in the center as well, I'll even add some yellow because that can represent some lights shimmering off. And if you notice, the closer I get to myself, the wider I make those. Uh, I can even throw in some oranges. Ooh. And that can also act as reflections of whatever lights might be there. Cool. And then for the background, we'll hop back in and use some blue. So just kind of trace around wherever your buildings are. It doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, just because we're going to go back in and fill this in, so just a rough shape around it. We're also going to get the buildings again okay. after this, so even if you overlap the buildings, it's totally fine. And even where the bridge is, you can go over the bridge. There's just a lot of filling. Um, yeah, it's kind of funny, like really what makes a pictured skyline is the water at the bottom and a bridge. Uh, even if you don't get the buildings correct, uh, it's fine because a lot of those buildings look very different at different angles. Yeah. Um, so as long as you get one slanty building, one building that has a lot of stacks on it, uh, and another rounder building too, or you can include the convention center because that just always has a unique shape. Mm. Um, so even when I, I paint them, I mess with the placement a little bit here and there because it's never going to look the same for everyone. Makes sense. Um, yeah, and then... How does mine look so far? Oh, it's, it's beautiful. It's very gestural. Okay. Um, <laughs> That's a generous description term right there for what this is. So what the buildings are going to act as now is silhouettes uh, to basically say that it's being backlit because the sun is setting behind the buildings. Um, so we can okay. sketch it with our darkest color, which for you, that would be your blue. Okay. And... Once we're done with this, we can go ahead and fill in the buildings with that same color. Okay. Um, yeah, when I, when I draw, I really like to take advantage of the fact that most markers are shaped uh, with a, a pointed edge and then a large flat edge. So that just helps me create shapes and stabilize the marker. And then the bridge as well. Uh, even though we love our yellow bridges, uh, it'll still act as a silhouette. So we can still go for that. Cool. And then, yeah, where the buildings are, you can go ahead and fill that in. I think I'm gonna fill mine in with a different color. Yeah, you can totally do that. Create a little contrast there. And then if you wanted to, you could add in some lights for the windows. Uh, the hard part of the lights for the windows though is getting them to look consistent and in a row. Um, so sometimes I just don't include those or I just sparingly include those. Hmm. Okay. Um, we are using paint markers as well. So in general, if you're using someone else's paint markers, I try to not blend the colors. Uh, but feel free, blend all you want with these. But these are point park bucks, so we, we can blend them. And then, uh, believe it or not, the closer you get to the bottom of these skylines, uh, you can actually transition it to a lighter color because that would, 
in theory, be something closer to yourself. So anything closer to yourself um, would be more lit up uh, because of a combination of atmospheric perspective and uh, just distance of lights. Um, so I could even transition this to a purple down here if I wanted to, or purpley pink. Cool. I wanted to make sure we had some bright colors because we noticed that a lot of your murals you use like very bright colors and um, I guess that's probably to attract like people's eyes but is there more to it than that? Yeah, I, I used to paint pretty exclusively with a lot of pastels, um, like less bright but still, uh, oh, less vivid but still bright colors. Um, once I started working with Shane Filster though, I. He, he uses so many vivid colors, uh, so I started transitioning to using more of those, so our, our pieces will look a little more similar together. Um, yeah, and then he he made me into a, a, someone that uses a lot of bright colors. Um, yeah, and it, it does attract the viewer's eyes quite a lot, um, but it, it also, I don't know, just takes whatever is surrounding it, whatever might be dull around it, and makes the context of that environment just more vivid and life gives it some liveliness. Um, yeah, yeah. So if you are like in a gray area where Pittsburgh loves its gray walls and gray buildings and gray skies and gray skies, uh, it can, th even if there are those gray things around there, there's still tons of color always. It's just that. With that context of gray looming over everything, it just makes everything a little more depressing. So if you have some vivid things to look at, then you can find the other vivid things around there. I ended hey. up adding those lights yeah. and windows, but... All right, I think that's that's probably about our time. So we wanna, yeah. let's show the audience what we got going on here. Ta-da. There we go. You can oh, I think yours is a lot. I think yours is much. <laughs> I see what I should have done. And art is subjective. So true. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Max, for um, the Pittsburgh Skylight tutorial and for having fun with these sketches with us. It was really great having you on the show today. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you. All right, and um, thank you for streaming with us. Our show is produced right here at the Center for Media Innovation with thanks from our partners at UVU Television and the Point Park News Service. I'm Michelangelo Pellis, and we hope to see you next time on POV.